for this week's lightning round, we're playing If You Were In Their Shoes. In the wake of an election, a number of politicians, elected bodies, and voters are taking action or preparing to take action. We're going to look at a few of those that are happening and ask our analysts to put themselves in the shoes of the decision maker and say what they would do. So, up first. During his campaign, President Trump made clear his strong objections to offshore wind and has indicated he wants to kill these projects. But the main legislature has made clear its strong support for offshore wind and has initiated a proposal off the midcoast. To that end, Phil, if you were in Donald Trump's shoes, would you try to kill Maine's offshore wind project? Uh, I think it needs to run its course, and I think the president or whoever he puts in a secretary position on this issue should come to Maine and understand what's been done at the University of Maine to d develop this technology to uh, hear from the lobster men and women who are fearing that this may be a detriment to their livelihood and see how this plays out. And if it's a microcosm of what might be a bigger picture, this will tell us whether it's uh, gonna be successful or not. That's a very rational thing for Donald Trump to do, which I can't imagine <laughs> he would do, but okay. how many fights he yeah. wants to pick, maybe exactly, he wants. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, look, to the winner goes the spoils. I understand that. And the president obviously was elected with a mandate, with a majority, and gets to move forward their agenda. But, you know, from an environmental perspective and from a respecting of states' rights around regulating uh, our own renewable energy, Donald Trump should stand down if he wants to try to stop new stuff that's coming down the line, et cetera, because of his ideology. Okay, that's his prerogative, but he should let this stand. Issue two is a rather unusual one. A constituent reposted the anti-trans comments that a recently elected Winslow Town Councilor had written on social media. That Councilor-elect Doris LaBranch then posted a cease and desist order against the constituent because she said her comments were being posted out of context. So, Ethan, if you were in this, uh, this councilor-elect's shoes, would you threaten legal action against a constituent in this way? <laughs> I would be in court every day of my <laughs> life if I wanted cease and desist orders against people who post things that I don't like or that, you know, even say things that are wrong about me. So, yeah, just a very bad move. You know, uh, the comments that the councilor-elect made were very unfortunate. They had a trans city manager who has now resigned right. because she was very concerned about this counselor and others coming in. So that's tragic. Uh, she won election, so she gets to go get to that body. But um, you just can't, you can't post, take legal action against constituents who disagree with you. Yeah, that's uh, to me a blinding glimpse of the obvious. The, the uh, state's woman move that she should have made would be to go contact that constituents and say, hey, we need to sort this out. That You've taken this out of, out of context and here is why. And I would take it a step further and reach out to the uh, town or city employee and make it very clear that this is not personal and it's not meant to jeopardize your career. Number three, on election day, Maine voters overwhelmingly passed one of the strongest campaign finance limits in the country when they voted to limit contributions to PACs supporting candidates to $5,000. As expected, some groups are considering suing. So, Phil, if you were in the shoes of those groups who are thinking of bringing suit over voter-approved PAC limits, would you do it? Yeah, I, I think we need to get a constitutional clarity uh, from this. It's interesting that the advocates for this piece of legislation uh, didn't go after the spending. They went after the contributions to the PAC. And that's where I think the Supreme Court ultimately is going to have to pass judgment on whether or not it's constitutional, and we should know whether it is or not. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the constitutional issue would be around spending. I mean, you can spend whatever you want. The issue is whether, you know, the spending is on the contribution side and the amount of money. Does it give you more voice if you're wealthy uh, in America? Apparently it does. And what this is trying to do is say no. But in terms of whether they should sue, look, I, I, I think they will. I understand, certainly, you should challenge stuff if you think it's unconstitutional. But this was passed overwhelmingly by Maine people. It's pretty solid law. Maybe the best strategy here is to let it lay because uh, if it wins in that suit, it could expand. This week, the Sanford City Council uh, had voted unanimously to back the city's needle exchange program to scale it back to a one-to-one -one exchange. That means providing one syringe to someone with a substance use disorder for every syringe they bring in, as opposed to the previous policy, which allows up to 100 needles for every one brought in. Health experts say this will harm public health. The city manager has said there are too many needles littering the town of Sanford. Uh, Ethan, if you were the man or person in charge of making this decision, what would you do? 
Um, I, no question about it. They should keep the current policy. They should not go back to the one-to-one -one policy that will harm public health. The documentation around that is very clear in terms of infectious disease, in terms of folks who have substance use disorders not getting help when you have a needle exchange program like this. More people get help. They get the counseling they need because they're engaged in it. Uh, look, litter is a problem too, but infectious disease is a much bigger issue than litter. But there are other ways to deal with the litter. Put out more canisters where people can throw these away. Portland did something brilliant. They've created a, a program where if you bring needles in, you actually get paid five cents per needle that you bring in. Remember, Maine used to have bottles all along mm -hmm. the state highway, right? How did we solve that? We created an incentive that said, you go take a bottle, you get five cents back. Do the same thing with needles, much better answer. Yeah, I, I see it very differently. I support what the town of city of Sanford did. Uh, this, this is an opportunity for people who are using an illegal drug that is not going to fulfill their best <laughs> self in the future to say, okay, if I'm going to use a needle and I'm going to have another episode where I'm going to inject an illegal drug into my system, I'm going to go exchange it. As opposed to, and, and Sanford isn't the only town that we, we hear of people having to deal with litter of needles that have been used and then thrown out. Up next, more and more, the snow days of our youth seem to be becoming a thing of the past for school kids. Some school districts in Maine are looking to implement remote learning days when a snow day can be predicted in time. Phil, if you were the school superintendent for Yarmouth, would you have kids going to school virtually on snow days? Sure. I think this is, a, this is one of those uh, phenomenons of technology that enables our students to get the education within the, the you know the schedule that was planned so that they're not having to spend more days in june in the classroom because they had days off in february yes Ethan? oh come on phil he's the sentimentalist let, here yeah <laughs> let the kids be free snow days An look unexpected day i know off. i grew up in new york we never got snow days what is a snow day but they're just awesome right i mean when you have a snow day and kids get to go free look i know it's hard on parents i know all that but uh, you can just have extra days in the spring, but there is an educational piece to this too. Remote learning is not as good as in the classroom learning. So we know that from COVID and we need to learn that if we're going to go to remote learning, it's got to be better because those kids are losing some educational value. But I say let the kids have their snow days. Look, I'm the traditionalist and he's like the modernist now. <laughs> who who would have guessed? Who would have guessed? Up la last in our uh, lightning round, President Trump is demanding that Senate Republicans not attempt to block recess appointments to his cabinet. That would give him the power to temporarily appoint people when the Senate is in recess, which in turn allows him to bypass the confirmation process, which can get sticky. The Senate would then have to confirm or oppose the nominee within a year. So Ethan, if you were in Senator Susan Collins' shoes, the Republican in the, major in the majority now, would you grant the president's request? Um, I, I wouldn't. I mean, uh, Collins doesn't really have the ability to grant it or not grant it. Um, I, I don't think it's a good idea. I, I do say, though, at some level, recess appointments are an important thing, but they should be used infrequently. The Senate needs to step up and take up their authority. You know, uh, we've been talking about is Donald Trump going to try to exercise um, a, a much stronger executive branch? Is this going to start verging into an area we're not comfortable with? I think this is a good example of how he's going to try to do it, trying to pressure the U.S. Senate to not do its job, at least uh, in the short term. So I, I look at it, uh, same result, but a little differently in, in terms of approach. This is an opportunity for the Senate to once again begin to do what their constitutional responsibilities are, which in this case is to advise and consent on nominations. Do your job, collaborate with the White House, move these people through the process and take the vote. So and don't, so don't right. grant the recess. And, and perhaps some of the choices that President Trump has already announced might make some senators say, wait a minute, we really do need to weigh <laughs> you in think? here. Yeah. Well, he may, he may have not done himself a favor with this. So, and one of the things to remember too, just real quick, is that if he does the recess appointment, they still have to do their job right. ultimately. Yes. He only gets them in position for a year, right? right. It's not like, they get to go in there for yeah. nothing. So the Senate ultimately will have to do its job, but better to do it up front.